Okay. Hi, this is Dave Michaels. We've got the UC Strategies team here today by video. Today's topic is UC on the go. We're going to be talking about expectations around mobile UC, including uh, user expectations, uh, IT issues, and vendor expectations. Uh, so, as with most things mobile, let's first turn to uh, Mr. Finneran. Michael, why don't you Hi, start, Dave, start us up? Yeah, well, the, um, you, you're right. The, uh, the, there are lots of flavors of uh, UC on the go. Everyone always immediately assumes we're talking about tablets and smartphones. Uh, a part of this really hasn't taken off that well at all. Uh, but for years, we've been recommending that, uh, particularly when users are roaming internationally, that they, uh, they use smartphone clients or UC clients on their laptops, uh, either at a, a hotspot, a public hotspot in a hotel room, uh, or, or conceivably over the, uh, the, the mobile network itself, though typically uh, international roaming is a, uh, one of the last great rip-offs in the cellular business. Uh, a big announcement on that yesterday, by the way, from T-Mobile, uh, who's now going to be treating about 100 countries overseas uh, as part of the, the, the user's home zone. Uh, but uh, at face value, it looks like this should be successful. Uh, people are already stressed when they're out of the office. They're trying to stay in the loop. And the sorts of tools that we can offer to them, however connected, be it via cellular networks, Wi-Fi networks, hotel networks, uh, should keep them as, as, as connected as they are in their, their home office. Uh, a lot of the tools have them difficult to use, so uh, I'd like to hear from some of the other experts about uh, what their experience or success or lack thereof has been uh, in trying to get uh, the uh, UC uh, uh, capability really extended out to those mobile users. But let me ask you, I was just at the STC conference last week, and the uh, uh, STC conference, they talked about the legal issues around around driving, and they, they suggested that there was some uh, employer liability if employees are expected to be uh, uh, on the phone while driving. Do you have any thoughts on that topic? Well, I have, I have very strong feelings on that because uh, I don't think anyone should be operating a cell phone when they're trying to operate a car. Uh, most people can't, can't do the car thing well enough to begin with, uh, and adding the additional complexity of the cell phone to it is uh, is more than a hazard. Uh, invariable, uh, invariably, when you uh, uh, pass that guy who's lomming along at 45 miles an hour in the left-hand zone in the big SUV, when you pass them, uh, they're always talking on the cell phone. People just can't. It's the the phrase that they've come up for it is called uh, inattention blindness. Uh, and indeed, there are uh, uh, liabilities. There have been cases settled for tens of millions of dollars. Uh, so, uh, the if you're on work hours. Uh, and driving a car and get into an accident, invariably uh, the lawyers are going after the deepest pockets they can find, and that's going to be the employer. Uh, but just for common sense, uh, certainly texting is insane. Uh, but you really cannot concentrate very well on two things. Uh, and the more complex the conversation, the more likely uh, you'll be ignoring something. Uh, and they've done some great studies. Uh, for example, uh, have somebody involved in a conversation, and look how often they move their eyes. Uh, essentially, they get tunnel vision. Uh, sometimes they're lucky enough to get home without killing somebody, but uh, you, you're, you're, just, uh, you're, you're just making driving more difficult than it has to be. What, what, uh, what, of course, what I should lawyers, say that I've suggested do, this Michael? policy to virtually every customer I've done, uh, uh, I've done policy work for in mobility, and not a single one has taken me up on it because the salesmen will all kill them. But not a good idea. So, so what does an employer do to minimize their exposure? I mean, if employer, if the sales folks are just going to be doing it anyway, how do, how do you how do you get by this liability issue without just looking the other way? No, you can't. Plain and simple. I mean, the, the, the best you can hope to do is ensure that they follow or, or your, your policy states. Uh, you must do the uh, whatever is required by the local uh, by the local laws, which generally means hands free. Uh, but the reality is that that's a that's a fig leaf that uh, makes makes absolutely no difference at all whether you're wearing a headset. And, and of course, in New York, uh, you'll regularly see people that they, they they won't hold the cell phone here. Instead, they hold it here or in front of them. Uh, so <laughs> they still have one hand on the wheel. They're not paying any attention. Uh, but somehow they seem to think if it's not held next to your head, it's it's less of a danger. It's insane. Uh, so, so I, I actually. Um, I actually had something happen last week. I was driving, and California has new laws, and I was turning on the headset because I was in uh, my husband's car, so I was actually trying to turn on the Bluetooth so that I would be hands-free, and a cop pulled me over because he thought I was texting, and I explained that I was trying to be safe and do the right thing by turning on my, my Bluetooth, and he said, well, nope, you have to do that before you even get in the car. 
You know, we can't even see you turning on the Bluetooth or doing anything that looks like you might be texting or using your phone. And he, he basically said, if we see you even touching your phone, you can get a ticket. You know, I, I had this weird little situation where I was in California where I think it's illegal in California, that's where you are, Blair, uh, to be talking on the cell phone while driving. And I didn't want to talk on the cell phone, but I wanted to listen to a podcast, which I figured was no different than listening to a radio station. And uh, the only way I could get the podcast was on my phone. And because my phone had a small speaker, the only way I could hear it was to hold the phone up to my ear the whole time. So I was driving with the phone up to my ear, listening to a podcast, not conversing, and for some reason that's a legal distinction except for that, the fact that I was holding a phone up to my ear, which would have made it a ticketable offense. It's a very gray area, uh, I, but I don't, I'm not sure how you can you know, make it not gray. Um, but let's move off driving a little bit. and start, So, uh, Roberta, what, what are your thoughts on, on mobile UC? Well, uh, thanks, Dave. I've got a good thing for using video is I, I, I want to make a point. So here's my mobile device that has basically everything I can do, right? So I got that. But here's the bag with all of the gadgets and accessories. So this has got my Bluetooth, my wired. It's got all of, you know, the adapters. It's got the power plugs. It's got the extension cords. So, you know, I, it's very pedantic, but my, my, all my apps are on this little device, but everything to use it is on this one. So some of the gotchas are, if I went to a conference, like my first UC Strategies last year, I forgot to take the, I had the brand new Z10, I forgot to take that custom little adapter. So I couldn't charge it, you know, so it's those little things. So yes, we had bandwidth, yes, we had, oh, lighting's another one that sometimes gets us where you're in a bad place and you can't see your screen, or I don't have nails, but if I had big nails, so it's those funny little things that you don't always think about, but you know, when I was getting ready for this, I'm going, this is crazy because this weighs more than my phone, but you know, I keep it with me everywhere now, so. Now, do you have, a, do you have a separate, do you have a separate pouch like that for all of your outfits that match, or is it just a coincidence today? <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's just all of all of our clothes are branded, you know, the, with the Canadian tax structure. Um, I also, I also wanted to add a po just a point from a traffic perspective. You know, if if you're conscientious and pull over in Toronto, we have some parts of the highway that are 26 lanes. So there's been there's new tracking to go. People pulling over to take the call are causing accidents because they're trying to be safe. So that's another, and I'm sure in other parts that have highways, right? But yeah, so this part here, this gotcha for me for the UC apps on the go is is the peripherals and accessories. Um, one one topic that's coming up more is about an employee confidentiality and privacy. Uh, you know, putting aside the NSA Prism story here for a, for a moment. Uh, I saw Esna, for example. Esna has a new uh, mobile client that has location awareness and can display, you know, your employees' locations on Google Maps. Um, and it's an interesting idea. And I know that, uh, in fact, uh, AVST has a similar. Uh, they don't do, they don't do the Google Maps integration, but they have location awareness within their application uh, called Atom. Um, when as employers roll this stuff out, is there a um, uh, requirement or maybe this should be, I'll say ex, uh, expected ex expectation that uh, this information is confidential or not. Anyone got any thoughts on that one? I did a design project with, when I was with Link for a Swiss pharmaceutical in Basel. And if you remember Basel, Basel sits at the intersection of Switzerland, France, and I think Germany. And we had to make it location aware in terms of which features were were um, activated because the company believed there were different privacy rules uh, for each of the companies, each of the countries. So the enterprises are thinking about it. I just don't know that they've collectively done anything interesting. Well, Joseph, uh, legal, legal legal issues aside, would you have an expectation if if you were an employee uh, an employee that had a Mobile client on your personal device, BYOD device. Would you would you assume that the employer would not would treat that information confidentially and only for certain eyes, like you know, or or you know, is it a feature that everyone knows about? I would assume that if it's an employer-owned device, that the employer would be recording or data mining anything that was that was going on. Wouldn't I, that seems to be the reasonable expectation in this post-prism era that we live in? 
Actually, we ran into that in the, uh, uh, with the, the city of Chicago. Uh, the, uh, one of the first places we started using location tracking was in cell phones for city workers so we could find out where the housing inspectors were sleeping. Uh, they eventually, the, there was a, a complaint from the union, which they settled in an interesting fashion. One, uh, the, the city agreed not to monitor them when they weren't on the clock. So not after 5 p.m., not on the lunch hour. Uh, and they actually sold them. Uh, on the idea that it was actually a safety mechanism because if they ever got in trouble, uh, at least they'd know where to send the cops. So uh, it's, it, it kind of goes both ways, but you do have a lot more control. It appears that if it's a uh, if you're dealing with a unionized workforce than uh, than your your traditional uh, uh, that management force. Uh, I, I okay. sort of... What about if someone's using their um, employer provided device after out like after work hours? Does the employer still have the right to See where the worker is. Um, if uh, the if well, <laughs> they, they as far as I'm concerned, no. <laughs> uh, however, uh, th those sorts of things will be spelled out in a union contract much more so than in a, a standard management employment agreement. So, the uh, but uh, the, it's it, it's funny when the, uh, the the economy is weaker and jobs are harder to come by. Uh, employees seem to be all too willing to give up more and more of their personal freedoms just because they have a job. So, uh, so I, I, I'm not the biggest uh, supporter of organized labor, but there, there, there are some good things to be said for unions. I guess if I could uh, throw in there, oh. this Clark, uh, ahead, Clark, isn't this just kind of an extension of, of some of the stuff that companies already do with information from like call logs, right? I mean, pe inside sales people are measured on their calls out. Um, I know companies like Accenture, they, they manage through uh, instant messaging, right? They know if you're working, if you're at your computer, right, and, and your boss actually monitors that. Um, isn't, you know, geolocation just an extension of that? During work hours, possibly. Sure. Yeah, definitely during work hours, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, Dave? Oh. Yeah. Go I was ahead, just going to... I was just going to say a, a wonky one we had to work with was where uh, municipal government gave their snowplow sand road clearing contractor corporate devices so that with GPS so that they could manage route times and trip times and we had to write the um, performance measures into the service level agreements because they had contracts about you have to get the snow plowed by such and such a time and the sand sand distributed so they developed the municipal government developed the solution and said you want the contract here's the devices and it was actually a very cost-effective way and and the vendor didn't really mind it because they could say yeah see you could tell we were there so it actually was it had ended up initially there were concerns about it but they ended up having some pretty positive results and it, and it was a win-win for the drivers and the dispatchers and the municipality so that was an example where you know, not UC on the go, but uh, information on the go is a positive. All right. Uh, let, let me switch it up a little bit. There's, um, Blair and I were recently at the IT Expo, and um, in their startup camp, there was an interesting company there called Perch. And Perch was doing something called persistent video. Uh, the idea of persistent video is that the video is just always up all the time, uh, creating a uh, two-way video channel. Um, effectively as a permanent window. Um, now, earlier, um, I don't know, five years ago, um, I knew a couple that was fairly close. They were both home-based uh, workers in different homes, um, and they would set up a persistent Skype session the entire day. And throughout that day, they would take their phone calls, they would do their work, they would have meetings, they would do all these things. And they created a, uh, a similar uh, uh, environment as, as cubicle workers. Uh, you can slightly overhear things, you, can, you, you don't have, uh, uh, but at the same time, instead of being home alone, you could always shout over, oh, that was an interesting phone call, or, or you know, what are you doing now, or, you know, oh, that's a nice, uh, nice new jacket you got, whatever. Um, Create, creating more of an illusion of a uh, at office environment, even though they're both in their individual uh, remote locations. Uh, do you think persistent video is something we're going to see a lot more of? Uh, and what, what, any thoughts on that particular topic? Well, certainly, my, my, my son and his friends have uh, been using persistent video for for years. Uh, it was like a, a video play date. Um, and essentially, they they, they were using well, they, they usually used uh, uh, the, the the Apple tools, FaceTime. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, oh, they they'd be talking on their phones to somebody else playing video games. <laughs> they just the, the the window was open to one of their pals. Yeah, we, Dave, we want it. We want it. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, particularly here in Seattle, we, we, this is a GoPro culture here, where people fire up their GoPros and they walk around with them all day long. Um, that element of unified communications is is really interesting because I don't know how you digest that, mm -hmm. unless all you have is one friend and you're just digesting their stream. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of on the edge there of unified communications because it's not real. It's it's passive, right? It, it's 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 like like I said, it's recreating that 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 cube environment or re recreating a, um, a a window, a portal to to a different dimension, a different world. Um, I I like the idea. I'm not sure I like it in a uh, on a desktop environment, but I could see it. You know, as you're walking down. Um, Maybe in maybe in common areas or something like that, where you can see into a different different sites area or or something like that. But but it's it's definitely you know the reaction at the at IT Expo by the way it's very positive. A lot of people really like that uh, like that concept. So what, so Dave? I will add to that. We have uh, so I'm at Seattle Pacific University. We're building a new dorm, and there is a real time camera on the construction site that the construction vice president monitors in real time. And he actually has that open in a link window and, and uses that to share that out with other people on the job. Um, so persistent video is going to work where there's a persistent value to having a visual record of something. I just haven't seen it uh, programmatized into a product yet. Dave, yeah, well, that's what, yeah, that's what Perch is yep. doing. Go ahead, Roberta. Yeah, I was going to say one of the ones we did recently that was was a, a VoIP UC project, but we had to end up redesigning the the, the land corporate land was for uh, public transit. And what we wanted to do, and the union agreed, it was to have the persistent video where the the people are fixing the buses and the trains because it used to be two mechanics and then it went to one, and so they could you know if if they disappear too down too far down for too long in the pit. Then the safety officer, which is part of security, could also say, "Hey, they've gone." They chose they would rather feel more comfortable with video than to have constant audio streaming, because we were going to have it where you could just you keep talking along, be constantly recorded, and if you hollered help, they didn't really like that. But they said, "Okay, for the you know if the, if they see the person fall down," so they were okay with being constantly videoed. They just didn't want constant audio. So that was a good thing for safety, but literally, the you know, as you can imagine, doing it if you've got ten or twelve bays in a big, huge, you know, and you're doing a lot of video, it's going to be interesting to work through the mechanics to what, uh, um, you know, to what the guys said about what it means to them, right? That's the part. That's the unfinished piece. I, I think, like anything, it's going to be based on the use cases, and for some companies, it's going to make sense, and for others, it isn't. And you really need to think about the use cases where it does make sense and where it's not creepy and overwhelming. Uh, you know, safety, transportation, things like that, it definitely makes sense. Thanks. For the typical desk worker, office worker, I don't really see the value yet. Healthcare but, would be cool too, though. Uh, oh, absolutely. Well, and that's what I mean. There are going to be certain verticals, certain use cases where it's really going to be valuable and make sense. But I, I think we need to really think about where it does make sense and not just throw it out there because we have the tools and technology to do it. But but where okay. where is it a company policy or company culture for that matter like you're suggesting where is it where is it a policy a culture issue versus a personal issue um, one of the one of the examples I've got I'm I'm thinking about is response time um, I think that you know with the with the era of mobile devices and uh, instant messaging uh, that there's a much shorter expectation on response time I can remember I can remember years ago if you send an email you know toward the end of the day. You didn't get a response until you know mid morning the next day, and and that response time seems to have compressed you know in general, but that's because people are always checking their devices and you know at dinner restaurants and 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 responding. Um, now that's easy for me to understand, and all of us we're all you know independent and we work you know all the time, but if you're an employee at a large company. Do you think that expectation is there for them as well, or is that a company issue, or is that a personal issue? Do you think do you think individual people are okay to set their boundaries around that? As I send an email to Joe, he's not going to respond until tomorrow because he never does. I'll take that one. Um, uh, we had we had some roles in that same uh, municipality 
where they wanted to have it where the system would be based on job roles. So if you were an on-call public safety officer, then the emails would go through. But if you were off shift, the messages wouldn't go through. So the CFO said, can you have it that we can define the rules of when things go after hours and not? So that was an interesting, so they were willing to do it, messaging and video and email and other things. But they were looking to have things automated by, by schedules so that people, they, and, the, and, the, and the senior exec said, we don't want our folks to overwork. We don't want them to feel the stress of thinking that if they're off shift, they don't have to worry about those. So that was, a, you know, to Blair's point, an interesting uh, view as well. So they were looking to the industry guys and gals to automate making that easy. Maybe that's the next business for somebody. Well, you know, maybe the next business too is is, is maybe around training or etiquette training. Um, this well, I've been a... talking about that for years. I, I I have I've written several articles and white papers about etiquette and um, you know do's and don'ts and best practices for using these technologies. You know, one thing that came up a long time ago when IM first came into um, vogue is that a lot of companies it became rude to call somebody without IMing them first to say, is it okay if I call you? And, and that's happening more and more. Um, so those etiquette policies are just so important and um, I, I don't remember uh, the URL, but there's definitely a couple of articles that I've written on UC Strategies that um, talk about some best practices and etiquette guides that companies have written. Good. Anyone else on that? No, I'm uh, from New York. We don't have any manners. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was just you all this time. Okay, so yeah, no, particularly as we introduce video, you know, and our, and our own experience here with this with this uh, this video session, you know, there's so many issues. Around, you know, I wore a striped shirt, not not smart uh, on a video call like this. Uh, lighting's lighting's an issue. Sounds always an issue. Um, I. I it seems that we've had a we've had a big move away from training. I, I remember rolling out the new voicemail system uh, in the late 90s, and we had mandatory training on how to use a new voicemail system. I can't imagine that taking place today. Um, and so, as companies have moved away from training and you know figured out on your own, know it on your own, uh, is that going is that a recipe for disaster as we move more into this uh, remote UC? Uh, I, I, I've always, I've, you know, I've, I've written many posts like Blair. Uh, I've, I've always held the contention that Reply All should, re, you know, require a license before you get that button <laughs> activated uh, in your in your email button. Um, and, and so, are, is there going to is there really a, uh, how, how would how would an organization go about um, ensuring maximum productivity with these with these types of tools besides just well, putting I it out there? I, I've been such an advocate of training and, you know, again, I've written lots of articles about how training is just so important. And the thing that happens is that a lot of companies just roll out UC and collaboration and some of these technologies thinking it's, it's intuitive and we don't really need to do training. But what happens is there are so many different features and capabilities, so people are going to use the obvious ones, but they're not going to use the ones that they haven't been trained on and the ones that they don't really know about. Um, an example I, I give a lot is I was talking to um, a salesperson who sells UC, and I asked about, you know, how do you like the mobile capabilities and being able to access UC on your mobile device? He said, oh, really? I can do that? And, and because he wasn't trained properly, he didn't know about all the different capabilities and things that he could do. So to not train, t uh, to me, is probably the biggest mistake companies can make when they're deploying UC. Of course, I, I, I go from the other school, which is the mobile school, which says if you uh, need a manual to go with that thing, you screwed up the design. It should be self-explanatory. That's the expectation today. And if they're missing it, may, may, maybe that's one of the problems they're having moving UC. Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to chime in there. You know, I think one of the real end goals from an end user experience standpoint would be as much transparency as possible with not only UC, but in technology. Not it's not necessarily achievable with every technology, but um, if you can accomplish that, then it kind of makes the training point mute if it's transparent. Well, our, our difficulty getting this video up would be more than a testimonial to that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. When and when technology doesn't, you know, you see isn't trans. For example, you know, when you're doing meetings like this, I remember when I was at Citrix and we introduced HD faces into the uh, online meeting tool. Um, you know, we'd spend the first 20 minutes of the meeting getting it to work, but it's a, it almost became counterproductive. Now there, 
you know, we were in a situation where we had to eat our own dog food, so to speak, and, and get it to work, and that's part of the process, but yeah. for others. All right, I, I want to wrap it up. I'm going to give you all an, an, an opportunity to respond to this last question, and then we'll wrap it up with that. Um, I, there was a recent Wall Street Journal article about how con phone consultants are being hired by organizations to come in to teach their millennials how to use a telephone. Uh, the, pro the problem, be the story was talking about was that you know a lot of them don't reach for the phone very very uh, intuitively. They prefer to use IM and, and email and other forms of communication. And the need for the consultants is sometimes to close a deal, you need to pick up the phone, and that was the nature of the story. Uh, and so it's it's interesting how things have turned so far to an extreme that what we considered you know intuitive and normal is now requiring a phone consultant to uh, to remedy. Um, so with that. Uh, my question that I want to uh, uh, pose to you is: Does this is the future of UC going to involve teaching people how to work and interact in person? You know, our office spaces. You know, right now we're getting office spaces smaller, but they're still there. They have hoteling spaces. Our office space is going to go away, and are people going to be working in their natural environment? And you're used to being able to control volume levels and what you can, what you see on your computer, and and you know, if you can't attend things live, you just play it back later and things like that. And, and then when they get into a live situation, they're they're paralyzed. Is that is that going to be a problem, or is that just ridiculously science fiction? So let's just go down the line. I'm, I don't know if everyone has the same line as I do, but I got Blair on the left. So Blair, let's go down the line. What are your closing thoughts on that topic? I think that would be really scary if that's what it came to. I mean, as far as teaching people how to pick up the phone, yeah, I've got two millennials, and I'm always yelling at them to pick up the phone because I'm tired of them IMing me, you know, ten times back and forth. And I always say, you know, after you know five or six IMs back and forth, pick up the damn phone. But they still know how to do it. I mean, they don't have to be taught how to do it. Um, and and the, you know, saying that because we're working in different environments, people aren't going to know how to interact live and in person. I, I think that's stretching it a, a bit too far. Uh, so people are still going to communicate in a way that makes the most sense for them in the type of job they're doing, uh, with the types of customers and people that they're interacting with. Uh, I, I don't think we're quite becoming robots yet, and we're going to know how to interact for Hopefully so, for a long time. Okay, so I'll put some words in your mouth. So your, your position is that the remote experience will continue to be more and more like the at-office experience and not necessarily eclipse it or redefine it. Okay? Uh, right. is, that, is that okay? All right. Clark? Where do I get that job to be that phone consultant? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah that, uh, obviously, but, I mean, Clark, obviously you advertise in the yellow pages. That's where everyone looks. <laughs> there you go, exactly. <laughs> um, there's so many subscribers still. Um, so my main comment on the millennials is, you know, I think they're, they're just they're too empowered, and, and I think you need to at some point kind of take a step back and, and force some things on them. Uh, they're and somewhat uh, a lot of our faults for, for raising them in that kind of uh fashion, but nonetheless, sometimes you just got to, you know, push stuff on them, I think, and not necessarily adopt everything to their, their needs and requirements. Oh, I like that tough love. All yeah. right. You, you, the line. You're lucky to have a job and shut up and smile. All right, Joe. <laughs> well, so I actually am one of those that will not pick up the phone. I, I like unified communications because it allows me to tailor how I interact with people, and, and I have pre-millennials. Actually, I guess they're millennials in the family, and they're very robust in the way they interact. So my biggest thing is, so when, when I'm at the office, I'm really not interacting face-to-face -face with people in my area. I'm running around the campus visiting different people in different places. So the concept of an office in place where I don't move is, is wrong anyway. You're on my iPad mini right now, and I, I do more work off the iPad mini in UC than I ever do at my desktop. So whether I'm at Top Hot Donuts or, or you know, sitting at the airport, it really doesn't matter. So work is where it is, and I need technology that can support that. I think that's where we're headed. Well, it's it's not nice to be at a donut shop if you're doing a video call because everybody gets hungry. Um, but uh, call it on a video call. <laughs> All right. Well, good, Michael. Well, I, 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 I'll take a somewhat contrarian view because uh, uh, I, I am a people person, and I, I, I see a decided like antisocial element that gets dragged in with all of this technology. Uh, people should be comfortable to deal with other people, uh, but of course, it's going to be a matter of degree. Uh, though it's, uh, I've done assignments for people, uh, multiple assignments, uh, 
uh, spec the whole job out, deliver the product, and never once talk to them on the phone. Uh, it's not my most comfortable way of working. I I much rather see people in person, get to know them and whatnot. But it's uh, that, that that's that that's me. Uh, but uh, I, I will uh, echo the point that uh, yeah, maybe, maybe we should uh, get the millennials more uh, more used to what it is to be adults than uh, than permanent IMers. Okay, Roberta. Well, um, in uh, various parts across Canada, I don't know about the U.S., they've actually stopped teaching cursive writing, which is going to be scary because this whole generation doesn't know how to write. So my suggestion to the public schools and high schools and even Joseph at university levels is how about we teach courses, develop and teach courses on communications protocols and etiquette based on the type of device so that people know how to use it. And I'm, I'm so committed about this topic of how to use the right mechanisms and processes based on your devices that my first book is going to be about the virtual organization but I think let's start down at the younger ages and if they're not going to teach them how to write let's teach them how to communicate and do it do it right. I'll sign you up as a guest lecturer Roberta. No problem. <laughs> well, I, I, can, I can outline well, my book there but yeah no it's, it's, it's important we have, to, we have to there's different rules based on different types and let's learn how to use them. Well, I, I, I think that the change is more inevitable than I think most of you would would, would, would think. I, I, I find it already difficult. I do a lot of briefings and and uh, you know typical the typical briefing format now is is uh, some sort of slide share technology and and you know sometimes when I get emailed a, a, a deck of slides, uh, I find it difficult to figure out what page we're on. I, uh, sometimes, I, even worse, I've, I've been in situations where I had to take notes via pen and paper, and those are never as organized and neat and tidy and useful uh, as my digital notes. I, I, I think that we're going to see a uh, a big move away, you know, it, it, a big move away from what we would consider normal, what we grew up with normal, uh, and I think it's going to be very awkward even for us in the next 10 years to return to a office environment. Uh, there, there was talking to some folks, and granted this was at a video company, uh, where they used to all go to the, at the, they had a meeting room, they would have their meetings in the, in the conference room, and, and the video company had desktop video on everyone's desktop, and so they started having desktop video conferences, even though they were all in the same hallway, and they found that better. They found that easier because they can, again, control what they can see, control the volume levels, they, they can take their notes on the computer, and, and and I, I think that that you know, and then and then of course they started adding people that were remote, and and going back to the conference room setting is awkward. Uh, you can't hear things and you can't see each other's screens, and it's it's awkward. And it gets to the point where it's like, well, this is ridiculous. Let's just go back to our desk so we get some work done. I I, I think we're going to see this permanent shift. Uh, I think we're I think we're in the midst of a very significant, profound, permanent shift. But that's my take. And because I was a host, I got to have the last word, so you're all wrong. Um, all right. Well, that I will. I will thank all all of you experts for our our video conversation on this, and uh, I look forward to our next uh, our next meeting of the minds.